So hello everybody. I guess we can start right on time. My name is Tim Jeske. I'm pleased to be your session chair today. Um, the session is on productivity management in industry 4.0 concepts and solutions. We got four contributions to the session, which means that we got 15 to 17 minutes for each presentation and five minutes for answers, uh, questions and answers after each presentation. Um, the first presentation will be on sensor shirts by held by Philip Petz. The second one by Roman Froschauer about assembly workplaces. The third presentation is on an analytical framework by Daniela Cavallo. And the third one is on the development of digitalization, which is my own research. I guess we can start. Um, please, Philip, uh, mm -hmm. turn on your okay. camera, your microphone, and show us your slides. Okay, can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see your slide. Okay, you can hear me? I can also hear you, yes. Okay, great, then let's start. Uh, hello, my name is Philip Petz. I'm a research associate at the University of Applied Sciences, Upper Austria. I work at the Embedded Systems Lab and focus on the development of sensors and microcontrollers. I wrote my master's thesis in the field of movement pattern recognition with smart socks, and I'm currently working on my PhD thesis in the area of predictive maintenance of textile sensor systems. Today I will talk to you about our most recent development, the smart sensor shirt. We have developed a shirt which is capable of measuring posture and movement with a distributed network of sensor nodes. These nodes can be modified and interchanged, as well as customized for the task at hand. This allows for fast prototyping of new sensor systems in the fields of occupational health, sports and economics. First, I will talk a little bit about smart textiles and wearables in general. Then I will also present the current status of research in this field, uh, followed by a short introduction about our sensor shirt. At the end of my presentation, I will show you first measurements and simple movements, how posture can be assessed, and I will give a brief introduction into the detection of more complex motions with machine learning algorithms. So why would you want to use smart textiles for your measurements? The biggest benefit is obviously the possibility of measuring unobtrusively and close to the human body. This allows to capture human motion in the human environment without interfering or restraining the movement of the wearer. In addition, the used sensors can measure strain, stress or threats next to the human skin, which is beneficial from a measurement point of view. These measurements are not limited to protective gear and can enhance our regular shirt, socks or gloves. It is therefore applicable in all the fields like occupational safety, economics or rehabilitation. One of the first smart shirts was published by researchers at the Pokyong National University in Korea back in 2009. They used textiles as electrodes to measure the electrocardiogram and featured an additional accelerometer on the chest of the shirt. The accelerometer was used uh, to combine the activity data from the user with the physiological data from the ECG. Additionally, the signal from the accelerometer was used to filter noise from motion artifacts in the stress ECG signal. As Fahani, Nussbaum and Kahn presented a custom smart shirt and commercial, commercially available smart shirts for the assessment to detect uh, physical activities. They showed in the assessment that smart textile systems could classify diverse material handling tasks with high accuracy. They therefore compared the performance of multiple machine learning algorithms like Canyon's neighbor, support vector machine, or an artificial neural network. The last example is a collaboration of multiple labs of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they developed a suit to perform large scale multimodal sensing. For energy and data transmission, they used flexible PCB tracks, which were inserted into woven tracks. As sensors, they used short flexible PCP strains with I square C capable sensors, which were then soldered onto other strains for connection. These four lines then connected to a node on the hip, 
to wirelessly transmit the recorded data to a base station. Now I would like to introduce our smart chat. We decided to create a shirt which uses stainless steel filament yarn for energy and data transmission. Our sensors and microcontrollers are integrated onto a custom-made PCB and feature press starts for interconnection to the shirts. This is done to ensure washability as yarns and press starts are made of stainless steel and are therefore resistant or more resistant to corrosion. This is especially important as the shirt will be exposed to washing machines, surfactants and prolonged heat during the cleaning and corrosion would ultimately alter the electrical properties of the connection. In the right pictures, you can see the layout of our first and second version of our sensor node. And as you can already see, the, push, uh, the, the, the largest footprint of all the used uh, elements. As a size comparison, one press that has a diameter of eight millimeters. The whole board is 40 millimeters long, 20 millimeters wide and four millimeters thick. Our initial version used an STM32 microcontroller with 80 megahertz, one megabyte of flash and 108, uh, 28 kilobytes of RAM. For movement measurements, we used the LSM6DSM uh, sensor from ST at a sampling rate of 100 hertz. Each node therefore has its own microcontroller and the capability to pre-process the sensor data. The recorded data will then be transmitted uh, via UART over the conductive yarns. A single Wi-Fi is mounted at the hip to power the whole shirt and to relay the same data to another device like a PC or a mobile phone. Uh, shortly after publishing this paper, we updated the sensor nodes to feature a Nordic NRF52840 chipset with its own Bluetooth stack. Each node can now pre-process the sensor data and transmit the measured values over a network of Bluetooth devices to a PC. We now also use the BMX160 sensor, uh, which also includes a magnetometer in the same housing. Our shirt, which you can see on the right, can be connected to up to nine individual sensor nodes. The positions are marked with the brown rectangles. Uh, we choose as position the upper and lower arms, the shoulders, the spine, and one sensor on the hip, which is also used for energy and data transmission. At the bottom of the image, uh, you can see also the sensor node lying on the, on the shirt. As already mentioned, uh, we have used stainless steel filament yarns to connect the sensor positions. One of the biggest disadvantages, however, of these yarns is the relatively high resistance of about 63 ohms per meter. Nevertheless, we decided to use this material because these yarns have a high mechanical durability and good oxidation qualities. In order to reduce the mechanical stress as much as possible, we have embedded all tracks in a meander form, in a meander pattern, into the textile. This meander form is configured in a bus topology to all nodes for energy supply. Uh, this is done via the VCC and ground pins. For data transmission, we have connected two contacts of the push buttons on the board with UART transmit and UART receive on the microcontroller. This creates a token ring structure or topology, where one message is always passed to the next node and the next node always appends its measured values onto the end of the message. If you would want to use a different uh, architecture, you could, uh, you could just short circuit the RX and TX pins I'd use a pull-up resistor and build like a one-wire bus system. So the, the shirt is not restricted to one kind of topology despite the limited uh, connections. In our first measurements, we noticed more and more problems with the data transfer. These problems occurred due to the high resistance in connection with the contact resistance of the snap fasteners. Furthermore, the energy transfer in the shirt leads to different voltage levels in the supply and different reference potentials in the sensor node. This means that depending on the data sent and the position of the sensor nodes, error-free transmission is no longer possible. As a solution, we have placed amplifier circuits on the inputs of our circuit boards in order to connect the incoming signals uh, to ground or the local supply voltage for better recognition of the original signal. 
Another problem was the power requirement in the individual nodes during the transmission, as the transmission of the measured data lead to an increased power consumption at this specific node. We were able to measure the consumption, and this was about 50 milliamps for 17 milliseconds in the last node. So during this time, the measured data of the node, as well as the information from the previous nodes, was transmitted. To ensure that the supply is not further loaded, we added additional support capacitors on each node. Uh, we used the calculation of time and um, remained current to get a, a support capacitor of 220 microfarad, which is sufficient for the last node and therefore sufficient for all the nodes. Uh, we also supplied each node with such a capacitor. Now to the measurements. For our first measurements, the linear acceleration forces and the rotational speeds of the independent sensors were measured in all three axes. Further, simple movements were defined and the results of the movements were then compared with each other. These movements included biceps curls, jumping jacks, push-ups and the natural movement during walking and running. With these simple movements, the speed of the movement as well as the number of repetitions can already be read without filtering or post-processing data. You can see here uh, each, each curl was taken. The course of rotation and linear acceleration for this test is shown in the image. And in this image, each line in each plot resembles one axis of the sensor. You have here the acceleration sensor of the upper arm and the rotational sensor of the upper arm, as well as acceleration and rotational speed of the lower arm. Uh, while doing the flexion, uh, we saw that the other sensors weren't merely affected as much. So for the analysis of simple movements, like uh, a simple curl, it is sufficient to estimate or to use a single sensor node for estimation and evaluation of the position and movement of the forearm. For the following tests, a moving mean filter was introduced with a window, window size of five which is sufficient due to the low speed of the body. This was proven in 2015 by Schreven, Beck and Smeets, who investigated the optimal filter parameters for a 3D motion analysis system. The second test examined how well different postures can be distinguished by the provided nodes. For this purpose, the three positions, leaning back, sitting straight and lean forward were defined and held for five seconds each. Since only the acceleration caused by gravity acts on the sensors in the idle position, the distribution of this force on the individual axis was measured for the orientation of the sensors. Sensors on the shoulders and the back. For the course of the orientation, the rounding of the back can be deduced. The graph on the right shows the angles of the three sensors in the three positions as a comparison. We have in blue, the angles which were calculated during the leaning back, in red, the sensor values for sitting straight and leaning forward in green. The difference between the two shoulders and the sensor on the back is noticeable here. Uh, this is also in correspondence to my image below, where my shoulders were more, more bent forward during this position. Now, the last test, uh, which shows the possibility of using uh, machine learning models to estimate the previously learned tasks. In order to be able to perform such motion sequences in a repeatable manner, the test environment was set up and the movements rotate, take parcel from desk, place parcel on desk, as well as place parcel in shelf and take parcel from shelf uh, were defined. During the test, the rotation of 180 degrees was carried out at random in both directions, and the parcel was placed on up to five different compartments in the shelf, also at random. This was controlled by a C -sharp application, which labeled the measured data in real time. During the test, the motion sequences were recorded several times at different speeds, and on average, such a sequence lasted for about three seconds per movement. From these labeled samples, uh, LSTM model was trained, where the test size was 6,030 uh, samples and the verification class was 670 uh, samples big, so about nine times the data in the validation data. 
And after training for 11 epochs, the LSTM model achieved an accuracy of about 80% on the verification data. So we have to admit this was the first attempt at machine learning algorithms and shouldn't be considered a golden model. Rather, we wanted to show that the acceleration and rotation data in the distributed sensor shed can be used to detect and measure more complex movements. At the end of my presentation, I would like to emphasize once again the most important points of my presentation. First of all, we have developed a sensor shirt that can be equipped with any sensor on the carrier board. This can either be a single sensor in a bus topology, like one wire, or any other sensor with its own microcontroller. By using snap fasteners, we have flexible connections to the conductive yarns with exchangeable circuit boards. Thus, the whole shirt can be machine washed with removed electronics. In addition, individual nodes can be quickly repaired, replaced, or extended and therefore allow a quick adaptation to new requirements in measurement and detection of human motion. As we have seen, simple movements can be read directly from the data and for this, no more complex models or algorithms are needed. Thus, the pre-processing and filtering of the sensor data can already be done at the sensor node, which can be adapted to the requirements of the measurement and the filtering requirements. Furthermore, also big plus, is that it's irrelevant during the development of the sensor shirt, which sensor will later on be used, because the connectors of the adapter boards determine the connection and the type of sensor which will be utilized. We were also able to deduce the curvature of the bed from raw accelerometer values, and this is particularly interesting for monitoring the posture for lower, uh, for longer seated or standing activities. Such measurements are especially useful for the detection of disorders such as muscle strain or lig ligament strain. In addition to the preventive effects, the detection of provide information about the efficiency and distribution of work on assembly lines in real time. Our sensor system can therefore be used as a universal platform for recording and classifying movement sections for economics, work and movement sequences or workflows. So this brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I will gladly answer all your further questions. Yes, thank, thank you, Philip, for your great presentation. Are there questions? Hmm. Doesn't seem so, but I got a little question. Do you think your suit is more to be used during work or just for analyzing work? So is it more for experimental um, period or already for using it the whole day, the whole week when someone is working in an area for which this suit is applicable? Yeah. I see, uh, I think the most benefit is uh, during evaluation of a new movement or if uh, for example, on a production line, you want to evaluate uh, new tasks, then you can easily adapt the sensor shirt for the new tasks. So this is the, the big benefit from our sensor shirt. Uh, you can, of course, use it for an all-day measurement. But I think the, the strong point is that you can versatilely exchange sensors, the sample rate, uh, filter algorithms uh, without any effort. So I think the, the strength is in the versatility. Thank you. Are there other questions now? There are not. So again, thank you, Philip, for your presentation and the answers. And we will move forward to the second presentation uh, about assembly workplace, which is brought to us by Roman. Uh, please, Roman, share our, your your voice and your screen uh, to us. Thank you very much. So the screen should be uh, visible now. Yes, it is. Okay, so my name is Roman Froschauer and I'm professor for production informatics at the Upper Austrian University of Applied Sciences. Uh, representing all collaborating authors of this paper, I'm here to present you uh, a human-centered assembly workplace for industry and especially the lessons learned during the development. 
But first of all, uh, we think about the motivation behind why we developed this. Um, the current situation is that we see a trend from mass production to mass customization. Uh, if you heard the key uh, to today, uh, today in the morning, uh, this is uh, often due to uh, customers buying individually, indi individually custom products. So, uh, sorry for interrupting you, Roman. Yeah. Now we see your picture of you, but not your slides anymore. Okay. Don't know why. It's interesting. If it's only a problem for me. Somebody highlighted for sure, Roman. Mm -hmm. And you need to click on the slides again, but I can highlight the slides. Thank you very much. I cannot highlight them myself. So. <clears throat> now the slides should be visible again, I believe. They are, they are. Thank you. Okay. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Some technical problems, but we have solved them. Okay, so uh, the motivation behind um, our research is that we see a trend from mass production to mass customization. So full automation is um, often not feasible anymore. Uh, human beings are coming more and more into focus. Um, so human potential still counts. Uh, this is often due to the complexity of tasks, the complexity of assembly tasks especially, and of course, uh, the missing of flexibility in automation approaches. Although there is a lot of research done, uh, we also heard some interesting approaches during the conference, but uh, for many assembly tasks, uh, full automation is still not feasible, uh, even because it's still not affordable because full automation requires a lot of engineering, a lot of hardware and so on. So what we need is, as Giancarlo Fortino said in the morning, we need to uh, include the human worker in the loop. But if we do this, we have to take care of the human worker and to reduce complexity. And that's the main research goal behind uh, our work. The research goal is to reduce the complexity by enabling seamless and easy to use digital assistance of assembly workers. So we want to uh, create a system uh, which is uh, enable to provide assistance or assistive measures to human workers using multimodal approaches, for example, showing uh, work instructions on a display, uh, providing information through a HoloLens, or just uh, giving multiple input devices to move, uh, uh, to, in, to improve uh, the work uh, procedure itself. So we have, re we have researched two different uh, topics. On the one hand, the organizational approach behind. So how can we capture the voice of the human worker? And also the technical approach. On the other hand, how can we implement uh, all these assistive systems together uh, and working and interacting and letting them interact seamlessly? So first, I want to introduce the organizational approach. Uh, we tried to develop a contextual design-based approach to capture the voice of the assembly worker. This is done by, uh, on, the first, uh, on the first step, by done doing contextual inquiries. This, by this means, we uh, designed a, a complete approach how to conduct interviews, how to observe human workers at their daily uh, life, at their daily work life, and also how to take notes and how to document all the work steps done uh, in order to, to have enough knowledge about which kind of work steps have to be assisted and also to have knowledge about how can this assistance can be done in an optimal way. Um, after the contextual inquiries, we also defined, uh, we also used uh, the process of taking so-called affinity notes and also uh, conducting a, uh, creating an affinity diagram, which is shown on the next slide. So we interviewed all the workers, we take notes, we took videos, and we all put this information together on simple post-its, which we call affinity notes. Uh, and this 
all these nodes describe the events, the problems, and the issues within the user's context. And bringing all these nodes together in a diagram and in a so-called wall walk, we organize all these nodes to structure the knowledge about the work process. This is a very important step in our, in our research to find out what the human worker really needs in their daily life. But only a technical solution without taking care of what the needs of the human worker is, is not really feasible for us. So we also, also tried to do uh, to capture the organization. But after defining the organization or the kind of work which shall be done, we also tried to apply technical approaches and to uh, research technical approaches uh, of implementing digital assistance. We divided these technical approaches into three parts. So on the first part is we just researched a method for easy setting up digital assistance. We need a device overlapping and generic approach of interconnecting all the systems. And we also need methods for contextual awareness. And these three approaches, we split it up into uh, an engineering approach by defining a new domain specific language, specifying the work to be done. And that next we implemented an execution environment, which is able to execute this domain specific language and also manages the communication be between all the devices. And finally, we researched several contextual feedback methods and tried uh, or researched how effective they are and which kind of uh, digital assistance is really beneficial for the human workers and which is not. The overall architecture uh, on the basis of these three steps is shown on this uh, rather complex picture. Uh, we will step into the details uh, right at the moment, but what you find here is the overall technical approach. So we implemented a kind of tool to support uh, modeling the work, which was uh, captured prior the contextual design process. And then we implemented a runtime system which is able to execute this work process and also to interact with several uh, digital assistance devices. For example, a uh, pick by light system, a tablet, a HoloLens, or even a collaborative robot. And furthermore, we also implemented uh, several approaches of how to uh, accomplish context specific assistance. But first we look briefly at the engineering part. Uh, when defining uh, workflows, we created a simple workflow oriented programming uh, domain specific language, which is used to capture the work steps to be done by a human worker at the assembly desk. We use therefore uh, so-called actions, which are inspired by the method methods time measurement paradigm, MTM called, and using these actions, uh, the worker or the, the engineer creates a workflow uh, which uh, depicts the steps to be done by the human worker or even by assistive systems. And attached to each of these actions uh, are so-called assets, which uh, are uh, contains all the data to be produced or consumed by an individual action. Um, Furthermore, there are also decisions between the actions uh, to take alternative uh, to take alternative paths and so on. Uh, so using this uh, kind of workflow specification, uh, we have a system in the we have a system which is able to check which work steps shall be accomplished step by step, and also we know which kind of data is required, which kind of work pieces are required, which kind of uh, uh, tools are required. All this information is captured in such a workflow. Uh, our runtime system is now able to execute this kind of workflow uh, at level at level two at cell control level uh, to monitor and to control all the associated um, uh, assistive devices. So once more, the workflow contains the required actions and all the, also the required assets, uh, the data and the workflow engine executes them and interconnects all the associated devices producing data or consuming data. Um, our runtime system or our workplace, uh, which is depicted 
on this slide is featuring several interconnected devices. For example, a simple tablet showing work instructions, a collaborative robot directly assisting persons, a beamer which is able to project uh, work instructions uh, on the desk. Also, we have uh, jutes here with uh, screws or other parts in it which feature a uh, grip detection uh, using ultrasonic devices. Also, we have implemented a simple pick by light system using uh, uh, LED strips. And for example, also we have what we have here are so-called smart or flick buttons. It's a kind of Amazon dash button. It's a battery part and you can put it everywhere you want and interact with the uh, work desk. For example, to proceed to the next step or to zoom in a work instruction and so on. And all these devices to, are interconnected using MQTT and the protocol which was developed during the project. And our runtime system executes the workflow and communicates with all these devices to manage the complete assembly process. So by this means, this work desk or this workplace is a prototype which we use then to test and to verify certain contextual feedback measures. For example, we tried uh, how digital work instructions are accepted by human workers. We also identified uh, certain methods how to implement picking support or object tracking. Uh, the key question is detect whether a person has the right part or not. And also we tried several vision-based recognition of assembly steps, uh, which was uh, really difficult to implement. But let's take a short look uh, on the, our digital work instructions. Um, remember, all these work instructions are, co are conducted by our workflow. For example, uh, when the workflow uh, uh, comes into the step reach, the information which is included there is shown on the display. For example, here is our a display application which presents, for example, an image of uh, the current part to be assembled and also shows a work instruction. And all this information is interconnected using our workflow. So for each step, for each action which is in the workflow, uh, the engineer can assign an image, can assign a work instruction, or can assign a position where the robot has to move and so on. And the application behind is built using Unity. So it features several uh, output devices such as a simple tablet. We also tried something, uh, some experiments with the HoloLens, a uh, normal display. It also features a smartphone or even a projection device. For example, here we have a projection device which projects uh, the frame around uh, this Lego play. It also projects the position where the human worker shall place the next brick. So this kind of assistance is also very beneficial if human workers are completely new to assembly tasks. Then we also tried to detect whether uh, the right parts are to be assembled uh, by implementing several picking support and object tracking technologies, such as uh, optical detection using a simple Kinect to detect whether the hand is moved into the right chute or to detect whether the right parts are on the plate. With Lego bricks, it works really good. With uh, other tools, it depends strongly on the, on the machine learning data which is behind. Uh, the key part is always that all each workflow, uh, each work step and the data which is to be detected, for example, the current work step requires the human worker to grip into this box. This information comes from the workflow behind. We also tried uh, a low cost tracking system. Uh, it's called Marvel Mind, which we used to also detect uh, in which uh, whether the human worker is gripping into the right box. It works really well with a precision of about two centimeters and it has the advantage that it does not rely on optical systems. Uh, there is also a publication uh, my colleague Sebastian Piminger about this system, uh, also very interesting, and it was very robo robust during the uh, during the, the tests, and is quite a promising approach. So, um, what was very important to us is to capture and also to 
find out what is what are the key requirements if a company would implement a kind of uh, human assistive system as our prototype there. So we have uh, spent a lot of time in figuring out the lessons learned, which I will show you now. Um, the key factors for our uh, for human assistant for human assistance is at least uh, the complexity of assembly task. You need a kind of approach to capture all the tasks to be done, to capture each data to be used, to capture the whole process. So the workflow modeling process is crucial for an optimal configuration and orchestration of, uh, of human-centered assembly. Only if you have a really good overall process modeling, uh, you can provide suitable and context-aware assistive measures. And what we also find out is that a lot of companies have no precisely defined workflows, not even analog, and certainly not digital. So when applying uh, digital assistance, uh, the first step is to accomplish, for example, our contextual design process to find out what the current workflow, what the current assembly task is about, specific task assistance. What is also an important task is the experience of the human workers. Uh, you must include the voice of the worker because trained workers don't need any assistance. Uh, not trained or new workers, they will strongly rely on assistive measures and you have to find um, the right way not to annoy uh, experienced workers and to still help uh, uh, non-experienced workers. And of course, what's very important, what we found out during our work, technological gimmicks are often just low-hanging fruits and are not accepted permanently by the human workers. So uh, of more often a, a simple device such a tablet uh, leads to much better results than a very cool HoloLens, for example. What's also important is the setup of, of tools, um, especially when thinking of digital assistive measures, you also have to uh, take into account that not each company has uh, the appropriate personnel to set up the tools, to calibrate the tools and to interconnect them. So you have to provide a complete software setup, which we tried to develop in our project, which uh, enables seamless workflow modeling, which automatically sets up uh, the communication and with a minimal amount of configuration. Then the acceptance of applying digital assistance is okay. If there is too much um, coding and configuring, most of the companies, so that's, that's not our focus. And finally, also what's very important are the environmental conditions where digital assistance is applied. For example, when thinking of sensors, you also have to uh, take care not to interfering human workers. For example, when applying optical systems, human workers often work in the line of sight of a camera. Um, also, the lighting is a problem when using optical systems. If you're using machine learned data, you have to take into account that you need a huge amount of training data to uh, reach um, a confidence level of the system, which is accepted by the human worker. 90% is not enough. You have to reach 99.9% because the first fail of a system uh, leads to misacceptance of the human workers. And what, what's also an overall problem about such systems is privacy. Systems assisting human workers may also record human workers and enable a kind of logging what human workers are doing. And that's a key problem, which has to be communicated in a very transparent way to the human workers, which kind of data is recorded, which kind of data is processed to provide uh, human assistance and so on. So this is a, a, this is a very important factor uh, because if the, the workers think they are monitored and their data is used, for example, to, to check whether they have uh, reached their monthly uh, amount of work they should do, then such kind of uh, measures are not accepted. So uh, thinking of the time we come to the future work, what, we've, what we still have to do is uh, 
accomplishing more evaluations, uh, evaluate especially how to optimize the display of the work instructions, uh, how to uh, more effectively, for example, use 3D animations, uh, and also to improve ergonomics in using trackers, uh, for example, the Marvel Mind or optical trackers and so on. And furthermore, we also advance the technology to support parallel processes for uh, modeling team operation. And also, for example, uh, what also would be interesting to record work steps on the fly. And what's also very uh, often requested, what was also often requested, is to support OPC UA for communication. And finally, we're currently working in other projects uh, on enabling so-called skill-based automation to bring together machine and human-based skills. So as you can see, we have a lot to do in the next one, three years. And if you're interested in collaborating with us, please contact me or my team. And finally, uh, the acknowledgements of this the research leading to these results has been accomplished within a project called Human Centered Workplace for Industry, together with six company partners shown on the slide. And also, we have also a web page where you can uh, get more information. And so, we are, I'm now at the end of my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm glad to ask them, uh, glad to answer them. And final sentence thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you, Roman, for your very interesting presentation. I guess especially the lessons learned can help companies if they want to take advantage of the opportunities of digitalization. When I look on the time, I guess we have time for one question. So other questions, please raise your hands. They're not. Um, I got a little question. Uh, you described um, you have inspired your uh, workflow, uh, your workflows by by MTM. Have you already thought about using MTM workflows as a basis for your work, just um, to reduce uh, the need for for um, making new workflows? <laughs> Uh, we extended our work, uh, uh, the, the MTM vocabulary, uh, because uh, defo uh, by default, MTM is, is suitable for capturing human actions. And we extended it, for example, to capture also uh, robot-based actions to model a human-robot collaboration. The workflow engine we use and the modeling is based on BPMN, Business Process Modeling Notation, um, because uh, it was more suitable for our needs than the, the default MTM uh, workflows. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you again, Roman, for your presentation. So, there are no questions. I won't ask myself a question. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention, for your participation in this session and uh, goodbye.